The federal government has hailed the United States of America for removing Nigeria from its list of countries with religious freedom concerns, calling the decision fair and just. U.S. Secretary of State John U U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced the removal of Nigeria from the list. In a statement, Minister of Information Lai Mohammed said the U.S. government's action justified Nigeria's position in December of 2020 that it didn't engage in religious freedom violation or had any policy of religious persecution. He said Nigeria jealously protects the religious freedom as enshrined in the country's constitution and took seriously any infringements in that regard. Well, joining us to discuss this development is Judo Ologun. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, Mr. Logun, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. When you heard that um, we were added, and then, of course, in less than a week, removed from that list, what came to your mind? Yeah, I was very happy. That is a very good one. When you talk about the brand management of Nigeria, because it, it, it did paint us in a very good light that we were classified as intolerant. And if you look at the position of the law, you look at section 38, subsection 1 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, and you also look at article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What we have is that every person is entitled to freedom of thought, conscience, religion, you know, including freedom to change your religion and hold beliefs and either individually or as a group or as a community and to propagate your beliefs. So in a situation where it appears that people cannot freely, without intimidation, express this fundamental human rights, then it must have been a worrisome thing. And the U.S. being the global police, classified Nigeria, not just Nigeria, some other countries around the world, has been intolerant. And there are statistics to back that decision up that were even generated within our own country. You know, though in the global environment, they have been watching us. For example, you take uh, the statistics uh, of about 43,000 Christians killed by Islamic jihadists in Nigeria, according to Inter Society, and then um, it's not funny at all. Mm. And this figure arose from total jihadist killing, not less than 70,000 defenseless citizens. So you can see that level of terrorism. And of, of not just Christians, Muslims were killed recently. We witnessed what happened in Jos, Plateau State, where about 90 Muslims were accosted and about 22 of them were killed. And then, in the case I, I, I refer to, the 43,000 Christians killed, the total number of Muslims, Muslim Muslims, killed by jihadists in the same past 12 years is with about 29,000 Naira. Uh, I said Naira. <laughs> 29,000. You must be thinking about a lot of money. 43,000 Christian dead. So when you put all this together, you must really be worried, hmm. knowing that the laws of the land and the laws at the global level can mix you to hold your belief. And that takes us to trying to define what intolerance is. I was, intolerance I was, I was is going to ask that question, and I was going to ask you directly, how tolerant okay. are we as nigerians because you know as a journalist you're trained to work with statistics facts and figures but realistically on the ground how religiously tolerant are we as nigerians and i'm saying this cuts across us being christians or muslims you know obviously with what the boko haram started that has now graduated to the advanced level even the name of the group suggests to you that there is a hyper intolerance to holding divergent religious belief. Islamic State of West African countries. And what is the intention? To establish Islamic caliphate. And so that means they are not willing to accommodate other religions. And it is not fair, really. We have instances, there was a particular uh, reverend that was killed, I think, in Adamawa State. And he was kidnapped by the Boko Haram in Michika, in Adamawa State. 
they demanded about uh, about two million euro and they were offered about 50 million but a video was released on january 5 of that year where the the, the man pleaded to the nigerian authority that please secure my release but he was eventually beheaded you see we also have the account of a 75 year old woman mrs bridget agbahim a christian trader in uh, i think in kano state who was beaten to death by irish youth for accusing her of blasphemy against uh, their religion and other instances like that and i mean there was this woman i think eunice elisha who was killed after preaching in in in, in kubwa in abuja so and it shouldn't be and going down to the root of all this these religions we talk about can we claim that they are primarily our religion as a people? The answer may not be yes, because basically, I think we have the background of being traditionalist. And if we have embraced these religions from other communities, then why are we operating as if we don't see how these uh, religions are practiced in those countries? For example, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia right now, Saudi Arabia is more permissive than it used to be because that country must continue to prosper. You look at the United Arab Emirates, it is a Muslim community, but you see how it is operated. You look at the United States, though a secular state, you can say predominantly a Christian state, you see how they are supporting their people. So I think we are just dealing with some extremists here. But like I said, for us as a people, as Nigerians, I think we have scored a public relations bonus. Mm -hmm. by what has happened and that means there must have been some reforms or that the statistics are going down but that is not to say that we still don't have a kidnapping and different kinds of insecurity that we have in nigeria okay I, i'm curious more to and where my question was going I, that's why i'm going to bring you back to it was a one-on-one -on -one basis for example we are so religious in this country so much so that um a Muslim girl and a, Mus and a Christian guy may not be able to marry because of the differences in their religion. Now, it's obviously not my place to decide who wants to marry who, but I'm, I'm trying to say, how tolerant are we of one another? Let's leave the terrorists out of this, because those terrorists are from amongst us. They started from amongst us. These are people who've been radicalized by our religion. And so this is why I asked, how tolerant are we as Nigerians? Let's not even bring the ethnicity into it religiously how tolerant are we because if we were tolerant of one another we probably would not have this monster called boko haram in the first instance would we basically uh, we we can only classify this perhaps in the area of marriage we've not had a wide spectrum of tolerance because the christians hold a belief that um the light has no fellowship with darkness. Why should it be unequally yoked with unbelievers? And on the other side, also, interestingly, the Muslims sometimes refer to Christians as kefiri, which is translated infidel, unbelievers. So basically, and that's why I alluded to the fact that if we embrace this religion from others, why don't we deeply study how they practice it? But in the area of how well we call other sectors in entire places where churches are next to mosques, when you go to places like Mushi, or it appears as if amongst the, do I say, the downtrodden right now, we, we people correlate. You know, when you talk about Lagos, for instance, you get to some communities, you see Muslims and Christians being friends. As I speak to you, I have Muslim friends, I have Christian friends, you know, I have a liberal mind towards it because what my Christian injunction tells me in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. So we are dealing here with the extremists. And can you even claim that they are religious? That's a big question. You know, I, I, I mean, the Islam is, is, is paraded as a religion of peace. So is Christianity. So where do we now locate this terrorism that we are experiencing or the hostility that we experience? So I think it's just the absence of discipline to accommodate the beliefs of others. I did a study. If you go back to the scriptures, 
the, the fountain of Islam may be Ishmael, given battle by Abraham. And Isaac also came from Abraham. So children of the same father uh, going in different directions in life in terms of religious uh, tenets. So why should we now be setting the place on fire? Because you do not want to uh, embrace my religion. No. And like I said, laws are put in place to regulate the relationships in communities. So if the constitution of the country, that is the grand norm, stipulates that we should be tolerant, why are we not tolerant? And if I may ask a question, since we have decided not to be so tolerant, what have we achieved? Poverty. So can we turn around and see how we can synchronize hmm. our efforts as a people and begin to enjoy the prosperity in the land? I have asked this question, what religion does crude oil practice? Can answer that. I, was, I was going to ask, since we're talking about the law here, I've always been curious about it. Our law, that legal document, is for a secular state. I do not know um, if our, our laws are, you know, carved for a religious state. Nigeria definitely is a secular state, but we do not necessarily act like it is a secular state. And I'm wondering if that constitution doesn't say that we, the religious people of Nigeria, why are we making religion the front and center of everything? You know, let me even specifically mention that section 10 of the Nigerian constitution 1999 as amended stipulates that the government of the federation or of a state shall not adopt any religion as state religion. And it only amplifies what we are saying here, that the constitution guarantees freedom of worship and no one should be victimized for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. But here comes a question. In terms of benefiting from the governance structure, don't we have situations where the religion you practice gives you advantage? Don't we have cases of nepotism? So, I think it's just been the choice of those who drive the system not to submit themselves to the rule of law and try to subvert the, the spirit of the constitution. And by and large, I think we should do what we call returns on investment. So why do we continue with intolerance that has thrown us into abject poverty as a nation? Mm -hmm. I've mentioned some countries of the world where they embrace one another and they enjoy the goodness of God. And as much as we claim to be religious in Nigeria, what in Nigeria, what have we shown for it in terms of prosperity to the people? Mm. And I think uh, we have come to the point where we really need to think deep on this. And I must appreciate what we have been seeing lately, that with the level of insecurity in the country, clerics and stakeholders are coming across board beyond religious sentiment to say, hey, this is a dangerous development. Because having said much uh, right now, you will, you will know that the terrorists, they are, not, they are no respecters of religion. As far as I am concerned, they have killed Christians, they have killed Muslims, they have killed pagans, they have killed soldiers, they have killed policemen. Or what religion does the fighter jet that the bandits brought down, what religion does that fighter jet, fighter jet defend? So those are questions. So. It matters what you allow within your society. Mm. It will either put you in the direction of prosperity or the direction of poverty. And look at the reputation of our country globally now. When, at the point in time, the Boko Haram was classified as one of the top tens of most dangerous terrorist groups in the country. And mm -hmm. there are other issues which may point to body language. You okay. can see the National Assembly having profiled the activities of the bandits calling on the president to declare them as terrorists. And the president is reluctant to declare them as terrorists. So there are several indications that we just need to wake up as a nation and begin to allow the light to shine, irrespective of the religion we claim to practice. Well, I want to say thank you. Judeo Logun is a legal practitioner. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We're hoping that we will stay off that list as time continues thank to you. go on. All God right. bless Nigeria. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. We'll take a short break now to watch the weekly highlights on the show. Yes, of course. And when we return, I will say my goodbyes.
but again how many people are really interested or even have the knowledge about what's happening within the budget we hear about the budget hearings the presentations that are being made but the average nigerian is worried about the price of food in the market the uh, the price of gas that might be ten thousand naira next year and all the other simple things so which Nigerian, other than you and I and a couple of us who are interested in what's happening within the budget, would be questioning um, all of these things under these ambiguous uh, subheads. The middle class, the middle class that has continued to um, keep quiet in the face of several injustices in Nigeria are the ones who are aware, I mean, though some would argue there's an absence of, of a real middle class in the sense of the word in Nigeria, what do you know what I mean? Uh, these are people who have a university degree. These are people who drive a car to work and have an office job or have a business they own. These are people who pay for their monthly subscriptions and different things like data. These people know what this means. And these are the people like you and I who should be speaking up about things like this. I mean, for a country that has consistently run a budget deficit since 2016 uh, or 2015, Marianne, um, you know, they say you should not spend what you don't have, live within your means. Nigeria right now is like a man who is borrowing uh, to fund a lavish lifestyle. Um, it's a man who's saying, oh, give me money, I need to pay for my, my children's school fees. Please give me money, I need to buy some food for the house. And then all that, then goes to a, a, a pub or a, a, a nightclub and spends it on the women. Um, the thing about the truth is that it's a movement we don't bring shit. Is the lie that is forever changing position. So you might hear people say one thing today and then review their position tomorrow because they necessarily have to keep adjusting their position to fit whatever the lie was that they told the day before. We have a redeem by government, if you prefer that, in this country today that has no regard for human rights. And the government is not pretending about this. NSAS protests happen because of failure of governance. I like to stress this point at every opportunity that I have. They wouldn't have been NSAS if we had a responsible government. If we had a government that lived up to its responsibilities. People came out to protest because there's vacuum in leadership. The issue of police brutality, the issue of extrajudicial killing of Nigerians has not been addressed till date. And you see till now, with all that has happened, Nigerians are still being killed almost on a daily basis by the police. People are still being extorted. People are still being arrested illegally. I receive these complaints and reports almost on a daily basis. So what that shows you is clear lack of political will, clear insincerity. Now, will there be justice in terms of implementation? Yes and no. Yeah. There are aspects of their reports that I believe that the Lagos State government is going to implement. The greater challenge, and I hope so, I hope so, I want to give the governor some benefit of doubt. The truth can never be given. And what I cannot also comprehend is the implication of the military. This was purely a civil matter, and the people conducted themselves in canonical order, okay? So there was no need. They had flags singing the national anthem. And so there was no need whatsoever to ignite the military. The police at no point in time said they had been overwhelmed. So you find a, a callous, conscienceless government trying as much as it can in a rustic manner, trying to oppress those that are clamoring for justice, equity, and fair play for good governance in the country. Because we have a government that has been pregnant to criticism, a government that is there, not in the interest of Nigeria, but is there in its own interest. And that is why we have that macabre dance at the theater of Thailand with the crazy street of Luhan. So I will not want to dwell much on what like Mohammed, who has no credibility, I'm very sorry to say this because it's a national thing, who has no credibility whatsoever anymore. So dwell but not that to the confines some level of prominence and importance to a man that ordinarily should be dismissed or imprisoned.
that's it tonight on Plus Politics. Thank you all for staying with us. Remember that we're first and foremost all Nigerians before we are north, south, east or west or even Christians or Muslims. It's very important that we see ourselves that way. I'm Mary Anna Cohn. Have a great night.